all through our years of growing up, my brother and myself, my mother struggled with alcohol before she got addicted to drugs. My earliest memory is when I was about six years old and my brother, who's 18 months younger than me, was four and a half. You know, she was on a bender, just drinking like crazy. My father was traveling. She told my brother and I to pack our clothes. We were going to have to live in an orphanage because my brother and I were fighting with one another and she couldn't handle it. She literally made us go pack our clothes. A stranger came to the house to pick us up. She put us in a car with the stranger and the stranger took us to a grocery store parking lot. And in the grocery store parking lot, um, he just turned to us and said, you know, you have to start listening to your mom. She's just sort of at her wit's end. And if you don't listen to your mom, then, you know, you're not going to be able to live there anymore. He brought us back to our house then. And I don't for one minute doubt that my mother loved myself and my brother. I don't doubt that at all. But I realized that you can't compete against a bottle of vodka. You cannot compete against whiskey. And you can't compete against prescription drugs. It just doesn't happen. When she was around 50, she diagnosed herself and convinced a couple of doctors at the time that she had fibromyalgia. This was her ticket to freedom. Very difficult to diagnose. She was smart enough to figure out ways to pretend that different pain points in her body when touched would be sensitive to that touch, and she then started to get prescription drugs. It started with Vicodin at first. Because sometimes she would not eat, physical things would actually happen, like she would actually trip. One time she, you know, broke a toe on her foot. My mother, my daughter Amber, and I were going on a trip together on a plane ride. She was on a crutch and her toe was casted, and we get to Alabama, and my mother forgot her medication at home. So when we were in the hotel room, she unwrapped her toe, re-injured it, which then caused us to spend a good portion of the time in the emergency room so that she could have another x-ray on her foot and get pain medication. Now she's got, you know, a supply at home, and now she's got a supply when we were on vacation, so when she gets home, she's got a great party ahead of her because she's got all this medicine. The things that she did, the way she sort of manipulated situations to be able to get what she needed to get is no different than someone who's on a corner, you know, looking for a way to be able to get a quick fix. All through my mother's 50s, she struggled with some sort of illness one way or another that was causing her to get prescription medication. And then my father had his stroke. So the year would have been late 96. My mother met a doctor, um, and I'm getting chills just thinking about it right now, who turned her on to oxycodone, and that's when it really just started to go down. At first, it seemed to be like um, good for her in that she didn't seem to be in pain and she had a better frame of mind and she was gentler toward my dad and more sympathetic toward my father's situation. But after a while, she would just track when she would take her pills and I have three by five cards of her handwriting of how she was like monitoring when she was taking the prescription medication because I think she was trying to convince herself that she wasn't actually taking more than she should, but she was. And it was an endless supply. This also started a trend where she would overdose on a fairly regular basis, at least five times, which usually was she took too much of her oxycodone. She didn't eat. Once in a while, she would mix it with alcohol. She'd go to the emergency room. I'd get a call, and I'd get there, and I would say to the doctor or the emergency room physician, you know, test her, her blood alcohol count or test her for, you know, morphine or whatever, just test her for something because I'm sure that she's overdosed. It's not that she just fell or that she's disoriented. And she would deny it. You know, she was always in denial about this, constantly in denial. Sure enough, you know, the next day they'd come back with the test results and her blood alcohol count was really high or the presence of opioids in her system was really high. But still, the doctor continued to prescribe them to her. There was a time when my mother overdosed. I walk into the emergency room. I could hear my mother's voice asking for morphine, that she was in pain. I want this. I want this. I want this drip. And they ended up giving her the drip. But then I went back to her apartment. I found 37 prescription bottles of medication from four different doctors. Most of them had like one or two pills in them, but all either for Vicodin or Oxycontin. And I brought all that medication to the hospital. And when I saw her doctor, I showed him, I go, this is what you're dealing with. She's going between Illinois and Wisconsin. She's going across the state borders to get medication. 
and the doctor who I think was the worst influence in her life, you know, he just seemed to ignore it. He didn't think it was like that big of a deal. All I think about from the time I was six years old and I'm 58 years old now, that's a long time, that's 52 years of trying to figure out how the hell to take care of a woman who doesn't know how to take care of herself or anyone else and refuses to get help. The memory of all the stuff that went on with her still lives with me every single day, every single day. My mother passed away in 2006. It was actually my um, grandson's second birthday. I had gone to the doctor with her two weeks prior, and I told the doctor once again that my mother's best day of her month is when she comes to see you to get her prescription refilled. The doctor said to me, well, you know, your mom's in pain, and she, you know, I don't think this is an addiction. You know, this isn't a drug that's addicting. And I said, she doesn't even eat. She's either falling in the bathroom or she's falling, you know, in the living room or whatever. When they take her to the hospital, you end up coming there and she gets what she needs. So she's figured out a way to get a fix until she can get the next prescription filled. This is a pattern and you're not helping at all. I'm like powerless to do anything about it. The doctor still filled her prescription and the, the twin's second birthday was coming up. And so she was going to come with us, and I was really excited that week because I thought, okay, that would be great. You know, she's going to come. This is going to be wonderful for her. And um, she called and said that she wasn't able to make it. She wasn't feeling very well. I just had this weird feeling all day long. I tried calling her several times. I couldn't reach her. She did end up calling me back, and she says, I, I just want to lay around anyways. I don't feel good. And I said, okay, well, we'll talk on Monday. So Monday came and Monday night came and I still, I hadn't heard from her and I kept calling her. Finally, I called the apartment building that she was living in and I asked them to do a check while being on her. She was gone. She was gone. And I'm like, okay, I was at work and it didn't really even sink in, you know, in a way it was sort of like she's gone. So it's like relief, but I know that sounds terrible. But on the other hand, it was like, oh my God, my mom's gone. And I never could fix her. I could never get her to understand herself. I couldn't even get her to understand me. She didn't even get that. Nobody was, has ever once been on my sideline, except for my kids, saying, you can do it. You can move forward. You know, we got your back. And I wanted my mom to do that, and she couldn't. And then I couldn't save her either. And so, you know, on the day when I'm having a good time with my twins' birthday party when they're two, She's laying in her bed dying. We got the autopsy results, and she died of morphine toxicity. The last year of her life was all about going to the doctor. You know, I took my pill this morning, and so I feel better, and, you know, I'm going to take another one a little bit later today. That, that's all it was. Every single thing was about that particular pill, which made her life so much better than everybody and everything else around her. If I was able to sit in front of the doctor today, I would like to say to him, if family members are involved in the patient's life and they're telling you the best day in that patient's life is the day they get to come and see you because they know they're going to get their prescription refilled and how this is destroying actually the entire person that's sitting in front of you that is your patient, it would be really great if you could just listen. And I don't know if the motivation for writing the prescription is related to great incentives for doctors. I don't know if that's the reason. I don't know if you really felt sympathetic toward my mother because you thought that she really was in pain. However, you really only saw her for like seven minutes a month. So you didn't really know her. And maybe it was just the time, late 90s, early 2000s, maybe enough wasn't known. I, I don't know. Although I find that hard to believe because it's highly addictive even though it was toted originally not to be. It would have just been nice if you just would have listened. My name is Lisa Curtin, and this is my story.